Hi guys and welcome to a series on the biomechanics of boxing. Many of you took part in our survey and asked would we be able to do a detailed in-depth version of biomechanics of specific boxing punches. So we begin today with obviously the most important punch, the jab. Now what this is, is a, a look at the biomechanics of the jab and force development in the jab. What it is not is it's not a basic physics lesson. So if you want to look up any of the um, terms that I'm going to use today, you can look them up on YouTube and look at worked examples of that. But what this is, is the application of these principles and how it works in the real world with the jab. Okay, so for those of you that are new to this, the jab is the lead hand straight punch. Now, an apology from me firstly, because I've got a very severe pectoral tear and um, this is going to restrict the range and speed of my movement for the video, but still it isn't going to affect me explaining the basic principles. The jab is the lead hand, the one in front, straight punch. There, that's as far as I can extend. So it is the straight punch. Let's look firstly at one of the limiting factors. And I do see this a lot with people. When we're throwing the jab from this point, to explain what happens is that the front foot should be at 45 degrees like this. The back foot at somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees. Uh, the further forward that front foot is pointed, the easier it's going to be to apply force in the direction of the punch. So, because the knee is a hinge joint, if we want this to apply force going forwards, we need to have that foot pointing as close to forwards as we can get it really in order to develop that. Now, what's happening in this is that when we throw the jab like this, the arm is turning biomechanically 90 degrees only. That's what it'll do. So I must start from here. If I start from here, the punch is only going to really get to about there, like that. If I start from here and try to get to here, you will see the elbow rotate externally, and this is what we call an elbow flare, and you'll spot my jab. Now, we don't want that. So we want to be from this position here, and it's going to throw, and it's going to come out there and land with the palm facing down. Now there are many versions of the jab. I'm going to focus basically today on two versions, the static and the dynamic jab. So that's going to rotate there like this and my, my trunk is going to rotate this way like that and I'm going to create tension in the, in the, in the legs and I'm going to extend slightly with the, the back foot. This is called plantar flexion when I do this. So as I throw this there, I'm going to rotate and the weight is going to be transferred forward. Now this is the static jab. The dynamic jab is where I push forward off there and move forward like this with the punch there. That's highly significant when we're talking about force development because at this point, no longer is the force just being generated here, it's being developed in the whole body. Now, force equals mass times acceleration. And one of the things that people will often do is when they're doing these calculations, they will calculate the mass as being the mass of the arm, i.e. the striking implement, if you like, rather than the mass of the entire system. So we're going to look at how we can influence that. Acceleration can be explained as the rate of change of speed divided by the time that that rate of change of speed occurs from. Now, in the case of the jab, we're starting here with a zero speed. Well, let's assume we're not moving at this point. And the rate of change of speed would be the maximum speed upon impact there because we've got zero at the start and then we've got say maybe 25 miles per hour at the moment of impact. So the difference in speed would be 25 miles per hour and the rate of change would be over the time it takes me to do that punch, which in the case of the jab would be something around about 0.15 of a second. So the force of the jab is going to be the mass multiplied by the acceleration of that mass. That is going to be the total force developed. Now, we've often heard it said in boxing, 
that some people will say that a puncher is only punching with their arms, like this. Obviously, I'm doing it slowly. Whereas other punches use their whole body. How does this affect this equation? Well, it affects it in terms of the mass. The mass of the system or the implement moving forwards. That affects that side of the equation. The acceleration of that mass, as I mentioned before, is what creates the force. So the heavier and the faster it's going, the more momentum it's going to carry and the greater force it's going to land with. Now speed is usually measured in meters per second. I'll give you some values though. A typical speed which a jab would land at for a trained individual would be approximately 25 miles per hour. That's around about 40 kilometers an hour for those who use kilometers. But in terms of meters per second, which is how we would do the calculation, that's 11 meters per second that a trained individual's jab would land at approximately. Everybody's different. The heavier weights would be a bit slower, the lighter weights would be a bit quicker, but the heavier weights have greater mass on that side of the equation. Now the net force acting on an object, which is your opponent, equals the change in momentum of that object divided by the time which that force is applied for. Let me explain that better. If I punch this punch bag and hit that, and my, fork, my punch applies force for 0 0.01 of a second, and then if I punch it again differently, and the force is applied for 0 0.05 of a second, I am applying that same force for five times longer, and therefore there is five times more force transferred. So the longer you hit something, the more force is transferred. Back in the early 2000s, we did a study in the sports science lab, and it was found that the variation between different boxes of different experiences would be that some people would punch and the contact time indeed, or time on target, as I would refer to it as, was as short as 0.01 of a second, with the longest being 0.04 of a second. So you could see that in theory, all of the things within the system being equal, that one puncher is punching four times as hard as the other puncher, just due to this one fact. So that's a science. That's all very well and good. But let's look at what we can and what we can't influence. Well, I'll tell you what we can't influence. We can't influence your opponent. Your opponent's mass and velocity is under their control. There's nothing that you can do about that. However, what they do with their mass and their velocity can affect the force of your punch. For example, if I'm punching and they're moving away from me, that force is going to be reduced. If they do is what we would call in boxing, they walk onto the punch, then their mass adds to ours, their velocity adds to ours, and the force applied increases. So if we can make someone move onto our shot, that's going to increase the force that we're going to land with. We can influence speed, so let's examine that. Now the purpose of this video is to look at the biomechanics, so I'm not going to give you endless exercises as to how to increase the speed of your punches and of your movement, but sprints and plyometrics should form a strong component of your training regime in order to maximize this. That's a subject for a different video though. Let's look first at angular momentum. Now let me explain this in the most simple term that I can think of. If I'm outstretched like this, in a circle there are 360 degrees. If I turn a full circle in one second, my angular momentum is 360 degrees per second. If I do that, if I do a half a turn in one second, the angular momentum would be half that, so 180 degrees per second. Okay, so let's look at angular momentum. 
the joints that are going to be involved in doing this in the main. We're not going to examine every single joint, but just the ones that are involved in the main. Well, obviously, this one here is going to go from here at around about 90 degrees bend out to here, like this, to more or less straight in 0.15 of a second. So we're going 90 degrees in 0.15 of a second. So to get the angular momentum, what we do is we take the angles and then we divide them by 0.15 of a second, the time it takes for that to occur. So the extension of the arm in this case is 90 divided by 0.15 of a second, which is 600 degrees per second. That's quite high. Now let's look at the angle of the body. Now, rotation is often overestimated when we are looking at the, uh, the jab because the body doesn't rotate quite as much as you would think. In fact, the body is from, if my front foot is at 45 degrees, which is where it should be, and when I throw my punch there, and I end up at about 85 degrees there, I've moved approximately 40 degrees, there or thereabouts. Now that occurs under the same time scale, so the angular momentum is commensurately lower. It's going to be a lot lower than the 600 degrees per second. In fact, it's going to be a little bit less than half. It's 266 degrees per second. So the rotation of the body is often overestimated by some. The arm is actually generating more speed. Now the other component that we really must pay attention to is the foot, is the back foot, how much this actually moves. Now this can be deceptive because from here to here, there, there can be a change in angle as we go there of up to 70 degrees. That's a lot more than you would think. Now of course that occurs over the same time frame, so the calculation for that is 466 degrees per second. So you're actually generating more, angu more angular velocity with your foot than you are with your body. You wouldn't think that, but that is the case. In fact, very close to twice as much. So extending with the back foot, plantar flexing the back foot is absolutely and utterly vital for developing speed in the jab. Now let's look at mass. Well, once again, this is where the back foot is going to have a huge, huge influence because the mass of the striking implement, if we just were to use a static jab like this, would essentially be the weight of the striking implement, the arm. However, that's because that's the mass in front of the force being applied. Now, the force in this case is just from the body, so the mass is in front of there. So your arm is gonna weigh six, seven kilos. If you're average size, if you're huge, it's gonna be a little bit more, tiny, a little bit less, but it's not going to be that much. But where can we actually really uh, influence mass? Well, once again, what we've got to look at is the physics of the situation, and it's behind the force that is up being applied to that mass. Now, if once again we drive with that foot and drive hard and fast with that foot, everything in front of that foot becomes the mass that is being driven forward. So as we go there, instead of it being the weight of the arm, we then are punching with the weight of pretty much the whole body. And that is where the difference is between punching just with your arm and punching with your whole body. The difference is immense. Not only is it affecting mass, I mean, in, in the case of myself, this is probably one-tenth of my entire mass. It is also affecting acceleration because if we just use the body's, uh, the body's rotation and the extension of the arm, these are only two components out of three. And as we've already learned, the one that's going to make quite a bit of difference is plantar flexing the foot. The answer being, therefore, if you want to make a huge, huge difference to your jab, from a biomechanical perspective, you need to plantar flex the foot and push hard and fast with that back foot. 
When it lands, keep that contact on for a little bit longer and the back foot, do not let it compress and reabsorb some of that force. Now, I did promise some bonus footage. So, here's a little bit of bonus information. Despite what you think, your jab is not your fastest punch. Your fastest punch is in fact your lead hand head hook because it's thrown with a hooked or bent arm and follows an arc and whips around. Your, your, your lead hand hook travels between 20 and 25% faster than your jab. We've measured it in the sports science lab, we know this. And if it isn't, you're doing it wrong. It's as simple as that. So your fastest punch is your lead hand head hook. And as we often say in boxing, speed kills. So practice that lead hand head hook. We'll cover that in a different video. The other thing I wanted to cover just briefly is what I call the half jab. This is one of my uh, favorite techniques. And the half jab, instead of going from here, goes from here. I'll demonstrate from the side like that. I like the half jab because I can line up where you are and I can line up off the top of my glove there. And then, as you line up with it, I pop that out like that. Now, with the half jab, if every time I throw my punch I'm missing by 10 centimeters, I just aim off by 10 centimeters and it will land. Now, the interesting thing about the half jab, we've measured this again in the sports science lab, and the half jab lands with pretty much 90% of the speed of a jab coming from here. Now this, yeah, we, I know, this is more defensively astute. But from here, if you want to confuse your opponent, you are use, losing very, very little power. It's also harder for them to see that elbow move and the travel time from here to here is shorter, but you actually don't lose a great deal of speed because the only component that's being affected in there is extension of the arm, not the rotation, not the plantar flexion at the back foot. So the half jab is a very, very good alternative and may land with 90% of the force of a full jab. I'll leave it there because I don't want to go on for ages and ages, but I hope you've enjoyed that quick biomechanical analysis of the jab.